through this initiative, the knowledge of the cultures, traditions, and practices of different states and union territories will lead to an enhanced understanding and bonding between the states, thereby strengthening the unity and integrity of India. It aims to celebrate our unity in diversity, promote the spirit of national integration, showcase the rich heritage and culture, and establish long-term relations. The successful fruition of this program would bear witness to a national environment which promotes learning and exploration among states. That being said, St. Xavier's College for Women, located in Alwa, Ernakulam, Kerala, is fortunate to be assigned as a partner to St. Pete's College in Shimla, Himachal Pradesh. Having previously conducted a literary event, Vivartan, as part of Translation Day celebrations, we all are gathered here today to discuss and familiarize famous writers from our respective states to our interstate friends. So let's strive to make this session interactive for doesn't it go? Tell me and I forget. Show me and I may remember. Involve me and I learn. Thank you. Before the official function, let's begin our session with a prayer. I invite Mella Maria from 2nd BA English Literature, St. Savis College for the same. What a friend we have in you, Lord. Oh, all the sins in grace to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to Lord in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, because we do not carry everything to Lord in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is the trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Now, I would like to call upon Ms. Shruti Francis M., the EBSB coordinator of St. Xavier's College for Women, to give the welcome address. Thank you, Mekha. Good afternoon, all. Hope I'm audible. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Ma Welcome yes, you. Yes, yes. Thank you. Welcome you all to this beautiful afternoon, which is going to witness the harmonious venture of two great departments of two great institutions. Thanks, Ek Bharat Shreshth Bharat, a central government initiative for this opportunity. My duty is to welcome this beautiful virtual gathering. I take this opportunity to welcome, even in their absence, uh, Dr. Gigi Joanna Masivia, our dear principal, and Ms. Nantini Patania, principal of St. Beats. I welcome dear heads of the Department of English and Communicative English, uh, Ms. Ahuja Ma'am, Anuja Ma'am, uh, head of the Department of St. Beats, Dr. Lima Antony, head of the Department of St. Saviors, and Ms. Bindu, Head of the Department of Communicative English. Next, I would like to welcome all the faculty members who have received our uh, in invitation and joined this beautiful venture. And I would like to welcome uh, a special faculty members, especially Ms. Renji, Association in Charge of English Association, St. Saviour's College for Women, Alwa, and Ms. Sonia John Marcos, my partner in EBSB Club Coordination, and uh, especially Dr. Geet Anjali from uh, St. Beats College, uh, English Department Assistant Professor, St. Beats College. I welcome you all. Last but not the least, students of both institutions. 
especially english association secretaries of saint saviors uh, ms roshni uh, ms mekha ms seren and ms sara and all the students of english department from saint saviors college for women alwa and saint beats college shimla himachal pradesh i wholeheartedly welcome all to this beautiful gathering thank you all once again well hearty welcome to you all this beautiful venture thank you ma'am for your warm words of welcome so moving on to the program as mentioned we have joined here to discuss about our regional literature and writers of both states i hope and wish that we all will have a wonderful time in the session so first i call upon fatima and anna maria of second ma saint saviors college alwa for their presentation am i audible ma'am yes yes anna audible you're audible good afternoon all so today i'm going to introduce you some of the renowned kerlite writers there are a lot of malayali writers the malayalam literature is very rich with fiction poetry drama and all genres of literature is available in malayalam literature but this presentation is only focusing on on those literary books which are either translated into english or written in english by a malayali writer so let's begin our session first of all let me introduce to you the most famous writer shashi tharoor he was born on 90th march 1956 and who is an indian politician writer and former international diplomat who has been serving as member of parliament lok sabha from trivandrum kerala since 2009 tharoor has written 19 books in english he has been a columnist in each of india's three best known english language newspaper <coughs> the hindu times of india and deccan chronicle he has also contributed to gentleman magazine washington post new york times and los angeles times one of his most famous work is the paradoxical prime minister narendra modi and his india which is a non fiction book released on 26 october 2018 and in this book tarur examines and questions the tenure of modi government now i am going to introduce you the most famous female writer arundhati roy She is an Indian author best known for her novel The God of Small Things which won the Man Booker Prize for fiction in 1997 and became the best selling book She is also a political activist involved in human rights and environmental causes Next one is Manu S Pillai He is an Indian author and historian. He is known for his debut non-fiction, *The Ivory Throne: Chronicles of the House of Travancore*, for which he won the Sahitya Academy Yuva Puraskar in 2017. His most recent book is *The Courtesan: The Mahatma and the Italian Brahmin*. So these are the, some of the renowned, prominent Kerala writers. So now. let me introduce you some of the famous malayalam works that are translated into english first of all let me introduce to you the most famous writer baikem muhammad bashir he was born on 20 january 1908 who is also known as beipo sultan who was an indian independence activist and writer of malayalam literature His writings were noted for his path-breaking, down-to-earth style of writing. His notable works include *Balaka Al Sagi* and many more. One of his famous work is *Madhulugal*. It is translated into English, titled as *Walls*, as a Malayalam novel. 
it is one of the most cherished and well known love stories in malayalam next as a most famous female writer lalitambika andarjana she was an indian author and social reformer best known for her literary works in malayalam language agni sakshi which means with fire as witness as a malayalam novel which tells the story of a nambudri woman who is drawn into the struggle for social and political emancipation but cannot easily shake off the chains of tradition that bind her next one is kagari shivashankar pillai he was an indian novelist and short story writer of malayalam literature he wrote over 30 novels and novellas and over 600 short stories focusing on the lives of oppressed classes chemin is a malayalam novel it tells the story of the relationship between karuthamma the daughter of a hindu fisherman and parikuti the son of a muslim fish wholesaler chemin is the first malayalam novel to win sahitya academy award next one is malayatu ramakrishnan kv ramakrishnan iyer better known as malayatu ramakrishnan was an indian writer of malayalam literature cartoonist lawyer judicial magistrate and indian administrative service officer he is a venerated icon of contemporary malayalam literature verugal is a malayalam semi autobiographical novel its english translation is available in the title named roots now it's about ovi vijayan he was an indian author and cartoonist who was an important figure in modern malayalam language literature kazaki ne itihasam translated as legend of kazakh the novel tells the story of a young university student who leaves a promising future to take up a primary school teacher's job in a remote village the novel has been translated from malayalam into french and german too next one is about mt vasudevan nair he is an indian author screenplay writer and film director too he is a prolific and versatile writer in modern malayalam literature and is one of the masters of post independence in the literature randa muram in english translation it is titled as the second turn it is widely credited as his masterpiece The novel is a retelling of the Indian epic Mahabharata from the perspective of Bhima, the second Pandava. Now it's about the most famous female writer Kamala Suraya. She was known by her one-time pen name Madhavi Kuti. Was an Indian poet in English as well as an author in Malayalam from Kerala. My story is an autobiographical book. The book was originally published in Malayalam titled Ende Kada. In the book she recounts the trials of her marriage and her painful self awakening as a woman and a writer. Now it's about Sedu. Sedu is a Malayalam fiction writer. He has published more than 35 books. He won the Kendra Sahitya Academy award in 2007. The Sage of Musiris is a translation of sedu's well known novel marupiravi which means rebirth it's a fascinating tale of the glory and decline of a major port a hub of maritime trade in kerala m mugandan is an indian writer of malayalam literature mayiri puleyude teerangalil is widely regarded as the author's magnum opus The novel widely describes the political and social background of Mahi, the former French colony. The novel was translated into English and French, titled as On the Banks of Mayiri. Here I introduce you one of the most famous feminist writer, Sarah Joseph. She is an Indian novelist and short story writer in Malayalam. 
She won the Kendra Sahitya Academy Award. She has been at the forefront of feminist movement in Kerala. Odappa, it is translated into English as Odappa, the Send of the Other Side. It is the third in the trilogy of novel of her. Odappa is set in Kerala Christian community. Now I introduce to you a prominent writer, Ennis Madhavan. He is known for his novel, London Bathiri Le Ludhianir. In English, it is titled as Ludhianis of Dutch Bathiri. The novel is about the life on an imaginary island in the Kochi backquarters. He also writes football columns and travel articles too. K.R. Meera is an Indian author and journalist. One of her famous work is Arachar, which is translated under the title Hang Women. It tells the story of a family of executioners with a long lineage. Binyame, who is an Indian novelist and a short story writer too. Arda Jeevitham, titled as God Dazed, is his most famous novel which portrays the life of an Indian laborer in Saudi Arabia. Subhash Chandra, he is a Malayalam novelist, short story writer and journalist who is best known for the 2010 novel Manishina Uru Admakadam. In English, it is titled as A Preface to Man. He is one of the most read young writers in contemporary Malayalam literature. Last but not least, let me introduce you Sajida Madatil. She is an Indian film actress and a theatre actress too. Malsi Gandhi is one night play about the travails, problem and the challenges of the fishing community in the age of globalization. So as I already said in the beginning, Malayalam literature is a vast literary field which is as vast as an ocean. And it is all about all kind of genres is included in it. As our presentation is just focusing on some of the renowned writers, this is what I presented. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fatima and Anne Maria, for that wonderful presentation. Next, I would like to invite Ms. Anmoldi Sindhu from St. Leeds College, Shimla, to give the next presentation. Good afternoon to everyone. I am Anmol Sindhu of St. Leeds College, and I am currently pursuing BA English Honours final year. Now I would like to begin my presentation. Hope you guys will enjoy it. This is the date of our college, wherein we learn, share, and imbibe great values. Upon a lofty hilltop doth it stand, amid its stern old sentinel, the pines. St. Bede started around 1904 as a teacher's training college, its evolution from a TTC to being a leading institution of education in Himachal Pradesh is quite remarkable, not to mention a few hedges on the road. Like in 1967, the college superiors decided to close the college as a new college, Jesus and Mary College, New Delhi, had come up. But owing to its premier reputation in providing excellent education, Dr. Yashwan Singh Parmar, the then Chief Minister of Himachal, made an appeal to his Lordship, Bishop Alfred, for continuation of the college. Unfortunately for us, the college flourished to new heights. This man is the architect of Himachal Pradesh about whom I'll be talking of today. His illustrious character and his connection to the cultural roots of Himachal Pradesh. Heaven is a myth, but Himachal, Himachal is very much real. My state is called Dev Bhumi and famous for its picturesque mountains and beautiful valleys. Apart from this, it also houses a very distinct and unique culture 
that we will be exploring through the lens of regional literature today the particular aspect that i'll be talking of today is a rather unusual and unique in itself that is polyandry or particularly polyandry in the himalayas this is the beautiful book i'll be telling you about titled polyandry in the himalayas and it is written by that very same chief minister dr y s parmar before delving into the book i would like you to give a short introduction about the author dr yashwant singh parmar he was born in 1906 in shillong village in sirmor district he was an indian politician and leader of indian national congress he was the first chief minister of himachal pradesh state and also the founder of the state he served the term as chief minister for two terms he was born in a rajput family in the erstwhile princely state of sirmor not talking of his literary achievements he did his phd from lucknow university dr yashwant singh parmar university of horticulture and forestry in solan is named after him he is rightly called the architect of himachal he was also member of theosophical society dehradun and almost all of his writings is about himachal political and cultural dimensions moving on this is the list of the books authored by him first is the polyandry in the himalayas that i'll be discussing about today second one is himachal pradesh case for statehood then we have himachal pradesh its proper shape and status where it talks about the political aspects of the state himachal pradesh area and language and strategy for the development of hill areas it is his development plan that he carved out in the very first years of the state now i'll tell you about polyandry in a more general sense first polyandry is the practice of marriage of a woman to two or more men at the same time it is derived from the greek polis which means many and aner or andros which means man there are quite some types of polyandry prevalent in the world today for example there is fraternal polyandry then there is associated polyandry and we'll be focusing on the fraternal polyandry that is prevalent in the hills of india such a custom is more likely to be practiced in societies with scarce environmental resources in recent world it is practiced mainly in plateau of tibet that is a region shared by india nepal and tibet autonomous region of china and the marcus island in the south pacific now talking about polyandry in the hills of the total 1231 societies listed in the ethnographic atlas of the world 28 societies that are still practicing polyandry are found in himalayas you all have heard about the famous tale of mahabharat and the protagonist draupadi and how she was married to the five pandavas the society of people of kinnauris that i'll be talking about today they believe that they are the descendants of these same pandavas it is practiced in some areas of high altitude till today fraternal polyandry in northern hills in northern hills it is uh, it is kind of a polyandry in which the men are related by blood kinnor in upper himachal pradesh is such an example where the tribal society still practice polyandry it is practiced generally in the societies that are male dominated and adherent to the ancient customs and traditions in such a setup of marriage we also come to know of the enhanced responsibilities of a woman and also to mention it is also seen in south indian hills among the todas tribes of nilgiris and najanad vilal of tremenkor moving on here i would like you uh, here i would like you to give uh, statistics of himachal through a recent survey conducted among kinnauris it states that still 13.26% of marriages in kinnaur are polyandrous and though it is illegal by law even the well educated and affluent families practice it in the name of tradition it was widely practiced once in kyothal bushar jubal and transgiri tract of sirmor and in kullu and lahol spiti many of these areas are now divided into various districts of himachal here we have a graph of the survey conducted among kinnauris 
So we see that the monogamy setup is still dominant prevalent as all over, but still polyandry holds some cases here, that is 13.26% of the marriages. Now I'll be describing the reasons for polyandry that Dr. Vyas Parmar describes in this book. First and foremost, the, so the so social security of wife. Having more than one husband ensures her perpetual status of being married, so enhances the social security. Second one is, of course, it is economically feasible. Third is the more, more stark that is still prevalent today, that is the poor sex ratio of our country. And the most important is to prevent further division of land. Dr. Parmar has rightly pointed out that there is usually some economic reason for a social custom and that without a change in economic motivation, no material and permanent change is possible. So here I'm going to quote from the book. I quote, the custom originated in the scarcity of land and women coupled with extreme poverty of the people gives without saying. Only because of prevalence of this custom that such a large population in the remote mountains is supported. Subdivision and fragmentation of holdings was certainly avoided and the check placed on the partition of families was worth it. Another reason for this practice is the control of the extent of population. It definitely checks the population. And there are also, there are also increased child survival rates because the child gets more attention and affection. This is the title that we have given to this, these incredible women of Himachal, the real life Draupadis of India. And it is in this context Dr. that Dr. Vyas Parmar points out that usually some economic motivation is necessary for a social custom. The book explores also other political aspects of such a kind of setup and how it has been radicalized in the recent times. It is concluded that although relevance of polyandry is debatable and controversial with the advent of modernization and exposure to outer world, yet it did not lose its relevance among some tribal societies such as the Kinoris in Himachal. Because it's not just about sharing of wife by male partners, but the wife also having many privileges over their male partners. And in the end, these social customs and our culture is ultimately the anchor onto which values and principles of our life decide the course of our life. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anmol Deep. Next, I call Anisa DA, second DA, St. Sivis College, Alava for her presentation. Hi guys, I'm Anissa from St. Xavier's College. Uh, sorry, uh, like currently second year English Literature. Uh, good afternoon to all. Today I would like to say something more about one of the most prominent figure in the Malayalam literature, Kamala Suraya. My friend Anna Maria has introduced her earlier. So let's get into it. Is this presentation clear? Is it visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. 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 Continue. Anisa, continue. The mother of modern Indian English poetry. She was born on 31st March 1934 in the Madras presidency of British India and died in 13 May 2009, Pune, Maharashtra. Her resting place is Palayan Juma Masjid, Tiruvandapuram, Kerala and pen name is Madhaviputi. She was married to Madhav Das at the age of 15 and used to write novel, short story, poetry and memoir. Let me tell more about her as a person. She spent her childhood between Calcutta, where her father was employed as a senior officer in the Walford Transport Company that sold Bentley and Rolls Royce automobiles and the Nalapata ancestral home in Punayakulam. Like her mother, Balamani Amma, Kamala Suraya was also excelled in writing. 
Her love for poetry began at an early age through the influence of her great uncle Nalapattu Narayana Menon, a prominent writer. At the age of 15, she married a bank officer, Madhav Das, who encouraged her writing interest, and she started writing and publishing both in English and Malayalam. Calcutta in 1960s was a tumultuous time for art. and kamala das was one of the main voices that came up and started appearing in the cult of anthologies along with great of indian english poets to her malayalam readers she was madhav kutti and to her english patrons she was kamala das kamala suraya is known in three names kamala das madhav kutti and kamala suraya she on the label the mother of modern indian english poetry because of her way of writing her writing infused with the power and freedom marked her as an iconoclast in a generation her open and honest treatment of free, female sensuality free from any sense of guilt uh, was prominent she was never concerned about the patriarchal society which was a plus as we got many of her ex- ex- exceptional works out of it in the first uh, whatever kamala das decided to do in her life has stirred a controversy in her home state first of all was her way of writing which was very bold and open in her later years when she decided to turn writing to painting her nude paintings caused yet another furor so did her decision to conversion to islam and to be called kamala suraya in the late 1960s her critics often speculate that most of her actions were to seek attention addressing the controversies surrounding her she once said it is probably because i have some courage to be what i am i don't see fault uh, as fault i see them as characteristic strengths too why not if you realize that you are only a human being it makes me really wonder whether a woman desiring to do as she pleases and even uh, be seen as someone living like simple the way she wishes to and nothing else with her poems she tried to give a voice to a generation of women who were confined to their households and considered as a commodity to be exchanged through marriage she portrayed women in her poems as humans with desire pain emotions just like men Her writing consisted of vivid descriptions of menstruation, puberty, love, lust, lesbian encounters, child marriage, and physical intimacy. On being a female writer in that day and age, she said a woman had to prove herself to be a good wife, a good mother, before she could become anything else. And that meant years and years of waiting. That meant waiting till the graying years. I didn't have the time to wait. I was impatient. so i started writing quite early in my life and perhaps i was lucky my husband appreciated the fact that i was trying to supplement the family income so he allowed me to, to write at night after all the chores was done after i fed my children fed him cleaned up the kitchen i was allowed to sit awake and write till morning and that affected my health it really makes me wonder how a woman can survive in those ages now coming to her works um she had written a tremendous amount of novels and poetry and some of her english works include alphabet of lust my short stories a doll for a child prostitute patmavadi the harlot and other sto- stories poetry the siren summer in calcutta the descendants all the house and other and other poems the strange time tonight the savage rides etc there are many malayalam works also written by her which i might exclude coming to the end of the presentation um i would like to quote some of the quotes by kamala suraya if wrappings of clothes can impart respectability the most respectable person are the egyptian mummies all wrapped in layers and layers of gold uh, i think she is trying to um, sarc- uh, she is trying a sarcasm against the way of dressing of the indian culture 
sorry uh, care like culture uh, you know we are supposed to cover most of our body like we are not supposed to wear what we like mm, the situation is more or less the same in the present age also uh, which is really funny considering the amount of freedom we get and coming to the next i quote it is i who drink lonely drinks at 12 midnight in hotels at the strange town it is i who laugh it is i who make love and then feel shame it is i who lie dying with a rattle in my throat i am a sinner i am a saint i am a beloved betrayed i have no joys that that are not yours no aches which are not yours i call myself i she was a daring woman of her age you know strong and daring uh, much to the fear of the patriarchal society that many of her works are still a taboo considered a taboo to read it uh, thank you friends for listening to my presentation thank you once again that was indeed an informative presentation on kamala suraya thank you anisa now i request bhavya patania from saint bees college to commence her presentation good afternoon everyone good afternoon everyone today i bhavya patania from ba english honors final year will be describing to you our very renowned hindi writer s r henoot and his powerful short story the reddening tree s r henoot was born in a very poor family on 22nd january 1955 he had a very tough childhood with very limited financial resources he belongs to a very small village chenong of tehsil uh, sunni in simla district of himachal pradesh he did his schooling from local government as well he was uh, after completing his matrix he was employed in the office of himachal tourism and retired as an officer in it after 36 years he completed his higher education through correspondence while doing his job He was always keen on studying and fascinated by the short stories and plays of Hindi literature. Therefore, he also started his career with short stories and Pahari poetry. Now, in this slide, I will be presenting to you the native place of S. R. Hanoot, Shimla. He is an also an environmentalist. That's why he takes part in the tree plantation activities and. takes a keen interest in with the younger generation and keeps on holding his literary works at the book cafe in shimla you can also see his place sunni and the writer's home as well in this slide now i will be presenting to you that himachal is divided into 12 districts and i will be throwing light on the shimla district which shares its boundaries with mandi kullu kinnor solan and sirmor it is basically famous for tara devi kalka shimla railway apple orchard heritage places like indian institute of advanced studies and chal uh, and chal heritage palace sunni which is the native place where our writer is born is a uh, is a small town which is 50 kilometers away from the hill station shimla first you can see the writer's place which represents a typical himachali home with its fields Now Sunni is famous for its adventure sport of river rafting and tata pani which literally means hot water springs. Sunni has remarkably made history by entering the Guinness World Record for ma- for making and serving 1995 kg of khichdi on the festival of Lodi. You can see our chief minister uh, Shri Jairam Thakur with the Guinness World Record certificate and some news clippings as well. Now that you all are familiar with the with Hanoji's native place I would like to bring your focus on the story the reddening tree lal hota dart it was first written in 1988 it was again modified by the writer and published in darosh tatha tatha anya kahaniya in 2001 it was translated by by dr minakshi fay paul who is a very renowned professor of our uh, of our shimla district So now, Redwing Tree. It is a powerful and a moving story about a farmer, Mathura, a pundit, and his family from Himachal Pradesh. 
Mathura is poor and who earns his living by performing rituals and ceremonies. Other than that, they have mortgaged most of their land to pay for the wedding of their elder daughter and for the ritualistic marriage ceremony of the Tulsi plant at Narasimha Temple to a Devta. It is told to the readers that Mathura land that Mathura's land has been blessed to have a people tree. It is considered very very auspicious. Plants from the Vedic times have been worshipped, but the recent developments in culture have made them superior. That they are now treated as human beings. Through this short story, the writer S. R. Hernot explores the absurdities of religious hypocrisies followed in small Pahari villages. Mathura family have only one. Has only one small field left, which would also have to be sold to the zamindar Gardhari to arrange the wedding of the younger daughter Munni, who is the protagonist and of the people tree. Munni is a young, innocent, and hardworking girl who does all the household uh, chores and helps her mother at field as well. She has made. Uh, she was made to read only till class three, where she stood first also. Through this uh, story, the writer S. R. Reno tries to bring the attention of the readers to the issues and conditions of women and child marriage. As in when Munni's wedding is decided, a lot of restrictions are imposed on her. Her her childhood is ruined. The only companion she has are her goat's Leela's two kids. To her, marriage meant nothing more than a hopscotch or the marriage of the potted tulsi. She overcomes with sorrow when she realizes that her parents would be destitute after they have arranged the two weddings. The mother believed that Tulsi is Tulsi and people had come to her home not to bring good fortune but to make them destitute. If they had only two daughters to give away in marriage, they would be less affected. So, in an extraordinary bold step. She attempts to free her parents from the from their worries by secretly marrying the people herself early one morning. In her innocent and pure mind, she believes that she has passed the test of how she could help her parents get rid of all their problems by quietly marrying the people. She feels she has solved the difficult situation and ensured that the field would not be sold. Her parents would not be impoverished. She is married, and so is the people tree. Most importantly, she believes that her parents would not lose the face in uh, would not lose face in the village for not fulfilling their duty. So the story ends with the union of a young girl with a people tree. Within the framework of Pahari culture, the writer had note weaves the changing truths of contemporary times. While the mountains, forests, water, land, flora and fauna of the Himalayas are present are present as melodic resonance in them. His story brought focus to issues of women, caste, class, nature, ecology, democracy, and development as central concerns. Now, I will be throwing uh, some light on his famous works and his awards. S. R. Note has published seven Hindi short stories and one novel. One novel hit him. He has also authored four books on the culture of Himachal Pradesh. Many of his stories have been translated in English, Russian, Italian, Marathi, Malayalam, Gujarati, and Punjabi. His stories are a part of other state syllabus as well. On the right hand side, you can see the uh, newspaper clippings of his works being studied by the other states, and on the left hand side are some of his famous short stories and novels. S. R. Hernot is an eminent Indian writer occupying a coveted place in contemporary Hindi short story writing. His short his, his short stories pres, uh, his short stories presents the little joys and unceasing ironies in the life of Pahari people. Over the years, he has been honored by various awards such as International Hindu Sharma Katha Samman, Himachali Kesari Award, Sahitya Samman by Hindi Sahitya Samelan Prayag, and so on. So I would like to end my presentation with a note that it is truly an honor for us to have writers like Dr. Minakshi Faithpal, Dr. Bias Parmar, S. R. Hanot, and many others to bless this holy land with their literary talent. Thank you. Thank you, Bhavya Bhavya, for enlightening us about S. R. Hanot. Next, I would like to call Chris Dania of Second Communicative English for her presentation.
Thank you, Rishni. Am I audible to you? Yes, Chris, you are. Okay. All right. So we have already come across to the various Malayali writers, very prominent Malayali writers, who have got, uh, who have produced a great contribution to the field of literary field of India. And here we have the very next eminent personality, who is none other than Shashi Tharoor. As the quote says, he is one of India's most significant politicians, diplomats, and contemporary writers. So the name Shashi Tharoor is really very familiar to each one of us because. He has been famous in most of these fields, such as literary field, politic, political field, diplomatic field, through his various courses, various stages of his life. So let's move on to his introductory part. Yeah, so Dr. Shashi Taro, he was born on 9th March 1956. He was an Indian politician, writer, and former international diplomat who has been serving as member of Parliament Lok Sabha from Sirivandavaram, Kerala, since 2009. He was formerly Under Secretary General of the United Nations and contested for the post of Secretary General in 2006. He formerly served as Chairman of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on External Affairs from the year 2014 to 2019. Make how the report to the next slide, please. Yeah, so as an introduction, we have already uh, come to know that Shashi Tharoor, he is a politician, he is a diplomat. He is a very famous literary figure in the Indian writing. And you are coming on to the personal life and education of Dr. Tharoor. Let's see. He was born in 9th March and in London, United Kingdom to a Malayali couple hailing from Palakkad, Kerala. Dr. Tarun graduated from St. Stephen's College, Delhi in 1975 and culminated his studies in 1978 with a doctorate in international relations and affairs from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, Tufts University. After obtaining his MA in 1976, Tarun further obtained his Master of Arts in Law and Diplomacy in 1977 and his PhD in International Relations and Affairs in 1978. So as we come to know, through his personal life, through his personal experiences, through his academic qualifications and a lot more experiences in his various posters, various um, institutions, various uh, organizations worldwide, globally, he has acquired a very prominent position and posters globally across the world uh, in fields of literary, political, Again, he was most famous for his diplomatic career, in short. So let's see how his diplomatic career has gone. Make the next slide. Okay. So Dr. Tarun's career in the United Nations began in 1978 as a staff member of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, which is UNHCR in Geneva. In 1996, Tarun was appointed Director of Communication and Special Projects and Executive Assistant to Secretary General Kofi Annan. He was subsequently confirmed as the Undersecretary General for Communications and Public Information, that is UNDPI, with effect from 1st June 2002. He has got a much more experience being uh, a diplomat, a diplomat globally. Coming on to his political career, as he is currently known for, uh, as he is a style MP from Pirvandaguram, Kerala. So let's see the political career of Dr. Saru. Dr. Tarun was a pioneer in using social media as an instrument of political interaction. In 2009, Tarun joined the Indian National Congress, that is the INC, and that may contested the Sabha from a constituency in Tiruvannamalai, Kerala state. Now moving on to the literary career, Mika, so let me go to the next slide. So we have already come across to the diplomatic and political life of Dr. Sadhu and the influence he has given or the contribution he has given to uh, those two fields, those two particular fields. And now it's more to the literary career where he has given a lot more contributions. The literary career of Dr. Shashi Sadhu has been quite a celebrated one in India. And we already know it. Dr. Sadhu has written 19 books 
in English. All of Shashi Tharoor's books are written on and about concerning India. Issues that are recurring in his novel are the political scenario of India and the effects of such a situation on the country. Apart from politics and diplomatic themes, his books also talk mainly about the culture and tradition of India. So, Dr. Tharoor's book, if we have, most of us should have been, uh, read Dr. Tharoor's books. And if we read each and every book of Dr. Tarot, let it be a book, let it be an article, let it be just a small piece of uh, information and any famous basic work, whatever. We just come to know how influential he is while portraying the current state of India, uh, portraying the influence of the past of India, which has actually influenced the present state as well as it could or could not influence the future of India as well. Even uh, the political scenario, the political contemporary situation of India right now, how it has been influenced through certain external affairs, etc. Like, there are so many lots, so many things which are concerning Dr. Taro and he has done beautifully, uh, you know, he has literally portrayed all those elements beautifully in his image. So, make the next slide. Yeah. So India's religious scheme and propaganda also finds its way into his, yeah, into his writing. His books are non-fiction, once again, focus on the administrative and political system of the Indian subcontinent. As I have already mentioned, it is totally involved with India. Majority of Saru's books are non-fictional, however, his contribution to fiction has also been noteworthy. The key that Taru's book deals with include the political and social discourse of India post and pre-independence. Especially he uh, presents to us the ways of uh, external affairs or even in short, or in Christmas here we can tell how British colonization has actually affected India, how deep the impact has still been uh, replicated in, in our country and so on. Like when we, once we read Shashita Taru's book, we'll come to know how actually a very good insight we are actually getting through the literary work he has actually contributed to the field. So Shashi Taru also employs the device, devices of satire, humor, and sometimes black comedy to perpetuate his concerns and ideas to his readers. The way he considers, the way he conveys his ideas, feelings, and thoughts in such a way that it will greatly influence the readers, uh, and also it will make the readers think like, Okay, so this is the way the, the certain, you know, kind of black humor, but cannot be told it in openly, but then the way the facts are being picturized is like Christian figure, we can demonstrate the way it has been. Be it a minute social uh, issue, be it a major uh, corporate issue, whatever, right from national to global level, he can deal with everything and he has done it so excellently that each and every literary work has typically uh, picturized the themes of India and the present scenarios of its concerns and its various issues being uh, recorded. And things such as Indian art and Indian films are a cultural aspect which Shashi Tharoor has addressed in most of his novels. The themes that Shashi Tharoor's book deals with include the political and social discourse of India post and pre independence, I have already mentioned. So his books through written about uh, serious, serious traditional political concerns of India are satirical and recurrently comic. So the next slide, Nathan. Coming on to the literary work or the contributions Dr. Tarud has done so far, when it comes to fiction, he has done four times. The first fiction, fictional book he contributed was The Great Indian Novel, which is published in the year 1989. The second one was The Five Dollar Smile and Other Stories, which was published in the year 1990. Show Business, which was published in the year 1992. And Riot, which was published in the year 2001. Now, coming on to the non-fictional contribution of Dr. Taru, Reasons of State, which was published in the year 1985. India from Midnight to the Millennium which was published in 1997. As you might see the year in which it is published, we could see it was 50 years apart, the Indian independence. So the book basically deals with, as I've already mentioned, uh, Taro has already picturized in his book, India from Midnight to the Millennium, on the various scenarios India has come across, right from the Indian uh, post, I'm sorry, pre-independent and post-independent state of the country. 
Then the next one is Nehru, the invention of India, which is published in the year 2003. Book Lake in Baghdad, which is published in the year 2005. The Elephant, the Tiger, and the Cell Phone: Reflections in India. The Emerging 21st Century Car, which is published in the year 2007. Shadows Across the Playing Field: 60 Years of India-Pakistan Cricket, which is published in the year 2009 with Shahid Yar Khan. Facts from the Car: India and the World of the 21st Century, which is published in the year 2012. India: The Future Is Now, which is published in the year 2013. India Shastra: Reflections on the Nation and Our Time, which is published in the year 2015. Inglorious Empire, where the British did to India, which is published in the year 2017. Why Am I Hindu, which is published in the year 2018, which is quite famous, and the paradoxical Prime Minister, which was released in the year 2018. The Hindu Way, which is published in the year 2019, and the New World Disorder and the Indian Imperator, which is published in the year 2020, co-authored with Sami Shalin. The paradoxical prime minister, the non-fictional novel, as we already uh, might have guessed it, it has actually influenced the citizens of India in such a way that it has actually uh, done a great impact on the vocabulary of Indian citizens. We'll come to know what it was. Take the next slide. Yeah, thank you. Illustrated books: Kerala, God's and Country, that was published in the year 2002, along with the artist Sir M. F. Hussain. In the in French or India in English, which was published in the year 2008, along with the photograph of Rande Franti. Now the most epic part of the presentation would be the speeches of Dr. Taru. As we all know, Dr. Taru, moreover, there the fact that he is a very famous diplomat, he is a very good politician, he is a famous literary work. He is the best known for his speeches. Be it English, be it Malayalam, be it uh, in his native country, be it globally, anywhere, his speeches are so eloquent. Dr. Taru is notable for his eloquence while speaking, as demonstrated by the popularity of his speeches. For instance, his speech decrying British colonialism delivered at the Oxford Union in 2015, while simultaneously being praised as groundbreaking in various educational institutions in India. Many note that it is his combination of wit. Charm, wry humor, and intelligence that make him accessible and held in high esteem both in India and abroad. So, as I already mentioned, the elegance of his speech, which actually influences the audience in such a way that they start thinking the right way. Like, what about the things? Be it be a global impact, uh, be it a global stuff, uh, be it a national level crisis, be it a national level achievement, whatever it may be. The speech Dr. Taru delivers is in such a way that it definitely influences the audience. So, additionally, Dr. Taru was known for his views on a number of topics, including economics, history, governance, and geopolitics, due to both his well-regarded educational attainment and his broad experience while at the United Nations. I explained and I mentioned it in one of the previous slides. due to his educational experience and his experience while being in the united nations as well as his experience while uh, being in a political uh, while uh, as an mp as a member of parliament all those experiences all those knowledge he has acquired along of his through his life it has actually influenced in a number of ways that he has actually contributed so far better in various fields such as economics history governance and geopolitics He is an outspoken supporter of the campaign for the establishment of a United Nations Parliamentary Assembly, an organization which campaigns for democratic reformation of the United Nations, arguing that United Nations needs to open its doors to elected representatives. Let us continue the slide. So the next one, the honors and awards as a contribution. For, us, for the contribution of Dr. Taru, the slide actually should be much more bigger than this. It definitely is something which is relevant enough to for a personality like Dr. Taru. So he has received a number of awards, right from national level to global level. Let's check what all are the awards he has received so far. In 1976, Rashika Kripa. The Palmi Young Journalist Award for the Best Indian Journalist in 2013, 1990, Federation of Indian Publishers Hindustan Times Literary Award for the Best Book of the Year 
So the great Indian novel, which is actually influenced by the story of Mahabharata. And in 1991, Commonwealth Writers Prize for the best book of the year in the Eurasian region for the great Indian novel. 1998, the Excel Year Award for Excellence in Literature Association of Indians in America and the Network of Indian Professionals. 1998, Global Leader of Tomorrow, World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. 2004, Pravasi Bharati is among India's highest honor for non-resident Indians. 2009, Siti Rizain Memorial Pride of India Award. 2009, Inspiration of the Year Award at GQ Man of the Year Award. 2009, Hakim Khan Sir Award for National Integration Maharana of Udaipur. 2010, Sarvadeshiya Pradibha Award. Parishi Raja Charitable Trust Koi Koda. 2010, New Age Politician of the Year Award at NDTV Indian of the Year Award. 2010, Fifth IILM Distinguished Global Thinker Award, New Delhi. 2010, Digital Person of the Year Indian Digital Media Award, IDMA, for popularizing the digital media in India. 2012, Spain, Commander of the Order of Charles III by King of Spain. 2013, First Sri Narayana Guru Global Secular and Peace Award at Tiruvannadapuram. 2013, Sita's Person of the Year. 2019, Sahitya Academy Award for his book, An Era of Darkness, The British Empire in India. May I have the next slide, please? Yes, uh, now coming on to the major part of this presentation. The flux and not the simplification effect by Dr. Sadhu. As we have already guessed so far, like we already came to know the effect on the social media uh, upon the Indian citizen on the usage of the term by Dr. Tarur, which was flaxin or simplification. This is a tweet. This was a tweet by Dr. Tarur. Uh, let's see how it was made and how what an impact it made. It actually influenced how what an impact it actually made upon the Indian citizen, especially the youth. Literally called get over the latest word Shashi Tarur used, flaxin or simplification. The Congress parliamentary was promoting his new book, The Paradox with your Prime Minister, through the tweet with this word. Make the next slide. Yeah. Dr. Shashi Tharoor's latest wordplay has left everyone feeling what can be best described in one word, Laksinasini simplification. And quite naturally, it has left the internet broken once again. The word Laksinasini simplification has 29 letters and is one of the longest words in the English language. This is a noun that is used to refer to the action or habit of estimating something as worthless. Why I consider this particular part in this presentation is that we actually wanted to know the influence of Dr. Taru on the vocabulary, on the English vocabulary upon the citizens of India, as I've already mentioned. He has actually urged the Indian citizens to explore the wide range of possibilities in the English language as a whole, I would say. And this has actually influenced us in such a way that many have actually come to try pronouncing first of all the word it has actually introduced in his book, The Paradoxical Prime Minister. And the next thing is like, this, we all started researching, we all started discovering such similar words, which are very difficult to pronounce, just like this floxy word. And so many, lot of words, uh, words have already been, uh, you know, discovered by many an Indian citizens. And, we shall see what the impact is actually had. So the next slide, flux fee word. This is actually the very first response from the Indian citizens, you and me, when we already heard the word flux in our sneaking simplification. So people are not only trying to pronounce this word, we are recording their hilarious attempts at it too. Some also are trying to come up with their own and similarly long words. For instance, did you just gave my mind ahead because it's flown? And two, three more. I'm so sorry, I really can't pronounce it. And there are some of the other words that got thrown in the mix. And this was the, actually the great influence that Saru had upon us, especially the youth, where they started discovering the English language in a whole wide variety of, you know, wide variety of niche. So the next slide, Mika. Yeah, Twitter to increase character limits so that Shashi Saru can complete a sentence. This is actually the very first effect by the Twitterity. This is, Dr. Shashi Tarad actually tweeted the sentence of uh, Floxin of the Nathan Simplification in the in his Twitter account. And this was the result of the, the so-called tweet. 
No, this is not an exasperating farrago of distortions. Again, another set of sentences which are very similar. After Shari Shashi Karo used the word fluxal or semi simplification to talk about his new book, which are considered increasing the character limits so that he can complete a tweet. Ironically, yet thinkable. Yeah. So, to the next slide, please, Nikha. Yeah. So, this is a photo of the new book by Dr. Shashi Karo. This is Taduro Zoras. As we all have came to know so far through his literary contribution, through his eminent literary contribution, that he's a wizard of words. The way he uses the words, the way he employs his words, be it a minute everyday usage word, be it a, be such a lengthy, confusing, very difficult to pronounce, such a kind of word, he already employs, he employs it in such a way that it actually influences us. It actually influences us in such a way that we finally will start discovering new words. We finally will start discovering new new terms, new new terminologies, new meanings. And also, upon reading his books, we come to know about various ideas related to the contemporary scenarios of our country, and, and so a lot more. So, Dr. Tarud also, after getting you know all these tweets from the uh, you know the these tweets back. He actually published uh, just uh, in September 2020 in his new book, Taruno Sora. He shares 53 examples from his vocabulary, you know, unusual words from every letter of the alphabet. You don't have to be a linguist to enjoy the fun facts and interesting anecdotes behind the words. You just have to be a normal citizen like you and me. So, like, you, anyone can actually find out such interesting words so that it actually helps, in, you know, develop our vocabulary, in fact. So as a concluding part um, related to my topic, which was Dr. about Dr. Shashi Taru, he, as we have already mentioned, as we have already explained, he is such an eminent person who has contributed to a lot more in various fields, be it political field, be it diplomatic field, be it the literary field, and so on. And the books, they have influenced us in such a great manner that we have actually found the real side or the darker side of various, you know, various uh, events, various effects, and so on. Especially the speech uh, Dr. Tarun had delivered at the Oxford University. It was really famous as the British colonialism, how it has actually uh, exploited the Indian nation as a whole, how it has actually impacted in a slight positive way as well, and a lot more of things has actually been reflected in many of his literary works. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Chris Daniel, for that elaborate presentation on Shashi Tharoor. Next, I would like to call upon Merin J.C. from St. Beats College to give her presentation. Thank you, Megha. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Merin Josie student of St. Bede's College. I'm a final year student pursuing BA in English Honours. As you'll have been listening to the other five members, both from Kerala as well as from Himachal Pradesh, telling about their culture and literature. So am I here to share few other highly debatable colloquial stories from Himachal, which are prevalent in Pahari Lokramayan. In order to tell about these stories, I'm going to refer to an article, Images of Sita in the Pahadi Lok Ramayana by Dr. Minakshi Faithpal, who is one of the very well-known contemporary writers. This is one of the 300 versions of Ramayana from all over the world. As you can see in the picture, this is a picture of Pahadi Lok Ramayana book, and it was written by Lal C. Pararthi, which was published in 1974, and till date, we are not known about its publisher. 
as you all can see this is dr minakshi faith paul she is a professor at evening studies in himachal pradesh university she is a very well known contemporary writer for her translations and poetry her researches are basically focused on folk wisdom traditional knowledge culture gender and justice issues no she is known for her some of the famous works kindling from the terrace fields a book of translations short stories of himachal pradesh life unfolded and many other these are few paintings from the ramayan scene in the first one you can see lakh uh, shrupnaka was attacked by lakshman in the second and the third picture you can see sita was abducted by ravan and later ravan approaches her for her consent to marry him here you can see two maps of himachal pradesh one is of the uh, one is the map which was before independence and the one at right hand side is the present map of himachal pradesh today i'll be discussing about una region and mahasui region this is the una region which is marked as p and in the present him, present map this is the place in una whereas this mahasui region is now split into different districts such as solan and shimla now i'll be discussing about a uh, lokatha from una region first other than its natural beauty una is also known for its pilgrim centers such as chintpurni temple and garibnath temple here i'm going to narrate a story from una region Once upon a time, Ravan levied a taxation system on his kingdom. Even the sages had the same obligation. Unable to pay the tax in cash or kind, he asked them to pay with their blood. Being aware of its miraculous powers through knowledge, Ravan poured the blood into the pot in order to maintain safety. He wrote a warning note which said, "Whosoever consumes it will be reduced into ashes." As Ravan was away for penance, Mandodari was aroused by passion and longing for Ravan, which was evoked by Kamdev. Later, as Mandodari approaches Ravan, asking him to quench her desires, but ignored by Ravan due to his meditation, Mandodari was aggrieved. It was then Mandodari noticed the pot full of blood with a warning on it. In order to sh show her anger. she decided to embrace the inevitable by drinking the blood to her misfortune she conceived realizing the gravity of the situation and aware of ravan approaching she locked herself into the room as ravan called for her she retorted by saying that he wasn't the ravan she knew as his voice resembles the seat of par as his thunderous voice rose Mandodari delivered a baby and hid her in a casket full of gold and silver in her room. On opening the door, Ravan found Mandodari sitting on the floor in order to camouflage her pregnancy to menstruation. In order to avoid any blemishes on her, she asks one of the ministers to take the child to some far-off place. In this way, the minister reaches to the land of Mithilai, kingdom of Janak. where he buried the baby in a field as the kingdom as the kingdom was hit by a drought and famine king janak's guru asked him to plow the field this way the baby was in the field was taken to the kingdom as the princess she was later named as sita so called janaki this is very prevalent story from una region now i'm going to tell you a short story from mahasui region uh, this mahasui region is named after the guru mahasui stealing a glimpse from the greek mythology here is the second story of sita's janam katha from mahasui region once upon a time ravan was blessed with a baby girl who was predicted to marry her own father bringing him downfall and death furious of this prophecy ravan declared to rip the child of her existence Mandodari moved by motherly affection laid the child in a casket full of gold and silver and drifted into the river 
After some time, a fisherman and his wife found the casket and opened it. As soon as they opened it, they realized the baby to be a princess. Fearing the severity of the consequences, it keeping in in keeping the child, they hid the casket in King Janak's field. Fortunately, the very next day, King Janak went to plow his field, where, to his surprise, he found the casket, which had an innocently smiling baby in it. This is how Sita, or Janaki, daughter of King Janak, was born out of Mother Earth of Mithila. Now I'm going to recite a poetry by Dr. Minakshi Faithwal. It is taken from Kindling from the Terrace Fields and it is known as Sisters. The woman crouching uphill stopped for a while. By the gushing spring, tumultuous and wild, they greeted each other in their wet embrace. They offered their lifetimes to each other's gaze. They opened the knot of their belongings and like long lost sisters, swapped feelings and longings. Their kinship bent deeper, their chance sisterhood for the women and the river are no strangers. Unbeknown to them, they have met in these hills time after again. The poem Sisters by Dr. Minakshi Faithful is set in a simple rural setting of the Himachal Pradesh. We see a strong bond between two sisters, a simple Himachali woman and a river, which she visits again and again. There are no sisters by chance of luck, but have repeatedly chosen each other to unleash themselves. In a society where patriarchy is upheld unknowingly, she opens the knots of her belongings for the water to excavate the hidden treasures of her very intricate emotions. As she gazes at the water, it feels like a lifetime where she meets her long lost self hidden under the societal clock of etiquettes. The women and the river are no strangers. Their kinship is deep and great for as long as women was one with nature. She keeps coming back to the river without letting anyone know just to extract the strength of life and wash off the cloth of drudgery which the regular day life wraps her around. Women still have a long way to traverse till they break all the shackles of bondage and make a mark for their existence. And the same has been very gracefully represented in the vivid writing of Dr. Minakshi Faithful. We are blessed to have such great writers amongst us who add up to the beauty of literature with the nature of Himachal. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Marin, for that marvelous presentation. Next, I invite Susan John from Third Communicative English to introduce some literary works of our dear teachers of English department. Hi, everyone. I'm Susan Shibu of Third BA Communicative English. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking with you today about some of the prominent works of the teachers of our department. They actually use written words in different styles and techniques to communicate ideas. So let's begin with Dr. Molly Joseph. She had her doctorate in post-war American poetry. She has published 10 books, nine collection of poems and a novel. Some of the books of poems that got published include Aching Melodies, December Dews, Autumn Leaves, Minas Musics, etc. And she has also done a translation of a Malayalam novel named Kidumbi. Aching Melodies. Aching Melodies resonates with the earning for the lost world, the loss of green past ravaged by the onslaught of man, time and technology. There is a bold exploration of the grim realities of the day. Atrocities committed against nature, women and helpless humanity. We can hear the anguished cry of helpless victims caught up in an earthquake or in a reckless bombing. Or as we can say that Aching Melodies is also a lament on the withering ecology which pervades as part of global phenomenon. So the second work is Autumn Leaves. 
Autumn list mainly, mainly tells us in a poignant way the sanguine and the sober reflections of life when the contemporaneity offers the unpredictable. Whether it comes in the form of flood, bomb blast, a total massacre, or a cardiac arrest. The gender concerns of the poet also highlight the woes of ordinary working women. The free verse straddles between the common man's idiom and everyday experience. Then we can move into Renjida Raghunath Ma'am. One of our notable works is Haunting Hues, which is mainly, which is also, which is a collection of poems, which, which hopes to offer a glimpse into the past and peek into the future with a barely balanced food in the present. A pastiche of emotions, this collection is a journey through time, reflections of moments, events, and interactions that change your perception about the world and people in it. We can also say that it also talks about the social issues like rape, abuse, and violence against women. Another poem named, named Liquid Assassin that talks about the effectiveness of sanitizers was also her contribution. Then move on to the another personality, Dr. Milan Franz. She has authored two books and published various research articles in international academic journals. The Legends of Kazakh. The book makes a post-colonial reading of the novel, The Legends of Kazakh, with a counter perspective to the ideological, cultural, and political positions inculcated in Indian society in the wake of colonialism and modernity. The protagonist Revi presents a poignant image of the modern man beset with the complex issues of identity, both collective and individual. Another work named Karichavattam, it is actually a collection of essays on various topics such as women related issues, social issues, etc. We can see various tones of unobtrusive and sincere emotional audacious experience all over the world. And finally, we have Jasmine Gonzalez Mann. She has actually done a translation of five Malayalam short stories of Sri C. V. Sri Raman. He was a famous Malayalam writer and recipient of Kendra Sahitya Award. His stories mostly deal with different themes like his experiences in Andaman Cobar Islands, unrequited love and refugees issues, etc. So that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan, for familiarizing us with the creative endeavors of the faculty of St. Xavier's College for Women, Alua. Throughout this literary exchange program, we all were introduced to various regional writers and the products of their creative endeavors. As yet another exciting exchange session draws to a close, last but not the least, I would like to call upon Dr. Geetanjali, Assistant Professor at the Department of English at St. Beats College, Shimla, to deliver the vote of thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So we are really grateful to St. Xavier's College, Aluva, Kerala, and St. Beats College, Shimla, for giving us this opportunity to learn about the literature and culture of the two states. As Rita Mai Brown has rightly pointed out, there is something fascinating about assessing stories of people and their culture. Language is the roadmap of a culture. It tells you where its people came from and where they are going. I thank our young dynamic presenters of today, Anisha, Anmoldeep, Chris, uh, Bhavya, Fatima, Merin, Anna, Maria, and Susanna, Suzanne for this fascinating experience that they gave us today. Each one gave a lucid presentation which acquainted us to the social and cultural milieu in which the respective works are set. They also gave us refreshing insights from their own perspectives which made this experience worthwhile. It is always interesting to know 
that to be a good writer, one must have roots in one's religion and family. I, I, I sincerely thank each and every one who presented today from the bottom of my heart for this experience that you gave us. I thank uh, the principal uh, of St. Uh, Xavier's College, Aluva, the principal St. Beats College, uh, Ma'am Nandini Patania, the Department of English of the Faculty of the Department of English, both the colleges, St. Xavier College as well as St. Beats College. A big thank you goes out to Ma'am Sruti for organizing and coordinating with us and Ma'am Anuja for initiating this event. Although she's not here with uh, us uh, this afternoon, but our sincere thanks goes, to, goes out to her. Last but not the least, the students who eagerly awaited this event and participated enthusiastically. We depart with the hope that we will come together once again with similar endeavors in the near future. Hope to meet you all once again and hope uh, we will have more of such sessions in the future. I sincerely thank each one of you for participating and for contributing immensely to our knowledge today. We have had a good insight into the writers and the works of both the states. Thank you so much, all of you. I would request the participants to ask questions if there are any from the presenters. I think, ma'am, because it is almost nearly yes. one and a half hours, so I think yes. we don't have any queries. And thank you so much, ma'am, for your uh, organization coordination and all those three students and four students from our department, our college, too. Thank you all, girls. You were uh, you rocked the entire session. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you once again. Thank you so and, much. Thank you. OK, convey my regards to Anuja, ma'am, too. Sure, 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 we will. Thank you. Thank you. It was thank lovely you, meeting all of you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So, dear participants, with this, we have come to the end of the session and end of the meeting. Thank you all. Thank you for your participation. Thank you, ma'am. 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 Thank you, ma'am.